I would be very worried about anyone who had learned their discipline via chat GPT. It's like an uncle who's just <laughs> always talking about stuff they don't know. Chat GPT is like that uncle on steroids. Uh. But I would not have that uncle tutor my kid. We don't have a such company that can create chat GPT and there's some, uh, you know, business magazines write stories that we need to catch up and create our own chat GPT. Do, do you agree with that opinion? Do we want to put our energy into racing to claim that we have the best technology so that we can you know, beat the US and China? Or are there other things that you know Japan can invest in? What is actually good for people in Japan you know, to ensure well-being and longevity and a happy life? That's the real question. はい、えー、ピボットの竹下です。世界的な AI 研究者のメレディス・ウィテカーさんのインタビュー後編をお届けします。えー、前編はですね、メレディスさんが、まあ、チャット GPT をはじめとしたこの AI の技術が、まあ、マイクロソフトをはじめとした一握りの、まあ、ガーファム大型テック企業の手に渡っている危険性を語っていました。まあ、とはいえですね、こういった大型テック企業の目的には利益なので、なかなか彼らの動きを止めることができないと。ではどうしたらいいのかということを後編で話し合っていきたいと思います。ヒントはですね、新しい選択肢です。えー、メレディスさん自身もですね、シグナルという、まあ、これまでにないプライバシーを重視したメッセージングアプリのプレジデントを務めていますので、ガーハムとは違った企業が出てきて、そういった企業がまあ対抗手段になるのか、そういった話をしていきます。あともう一つですね、メレディスさんはもともと Google 社員だったんですけど、ある理由で Google を辞めたんですね。そこはなぜ辞めたのか、その真相も語られますので、その話も聞いていきたいと思います。Do you think there is a positive side of chat GPT? Because I read,、uh, I think it was the MIT Technology Review that a high school student wrote a piece that chat GPT can act as like a private tutor, so it might change the education system and People can learn by themselves. Do you, do you think there is some positive sides of ChatGPT?、Um, I mean, I would be very worried about anyone who had learned their discipline via ChatGPT. <laughs>、okay. So, you know, like what ChatGPT does well is it quickly spits out very plausible,、mm. well formatted answers. It does not give correct answers. And we've actually seen, you know, the It, it, you know, it looks correct. Yes. That's all it does. It feels you know, right. Yes. You know, it's like an uncle who's just <laughs> always talking about stuff they don't know. <laughs> it kind of sounds right, but when you look it up on Wikipedia, it's totally wrong. So, you know, that, like ChatGPT is like that uncle on steroids.、Uh. <laughs> I would not have that uncle tutor my kid.、Mm. Um, you know, to the bigger question, are there positive use cases? You know, I think. I'm sure we could sit here and we could imagine a number of positive use cases.、Mm -hmm. The issue for me isn't are there hypotheticals in、mm -hmm. which this technology could do interesting or fun or useful things. I'm sure there are.、Mm -hmm. Are those hypotheticals going to be how ChatGPT is used, given that it is governed by the imperatives of Microsoft、mm -hmm. and given? The interests of the organizations that would ultimately have the money to use it, right? The question is who gets to decide how it's used、mm -hmm. and who will it be used on?、Mm -hmm. And so those questions instruct me to answer that no, I'm not hugely optimistic because I don't see a historical record of you know, those imperatives leading to you know, the realization of these hypothetical you know, beneficial use cases.、Mm -hmm. I see. Um, it's also、uh, complicated in Japan because、um, in Japan,、uh, there's a narrative that people are uh, obviously uh, afraid of ChatGPT and they understand the dangers of it. But at the same time,、um, we kind of envy the United States and China because we don't have a, such a company that can create ChatGPT. And there's some、uh, you know, business magazines write stories that we need to catch up and create our own ChatGPT. Do, do you agree with that opinion? Well,、mm -hmm. I would just say catch up at what? You know, like, what are we actually trying? How are we trying to live?、Mm. How do we want, you know, like, what is actually good for people in Japan, you know, to ensure well being and longevity and a happy life? You know, do we want to put our energy into, you know, racing to claim that we have, you know, the best technology so that we can, you know, beat the US and China? Or are there other things that, 
you know, Japan can invest in. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's the real question. I don't, you know, there, there's also, you know, in the US, a very powerful narrative around the, you know, AI arms race with China. Yes. Uh -huh. And this narrative is often used to say that, you know, we cannot stop development and think about ethics and think about democracy and think about the public good. Because if we do, we will lose to China. Yes. Uh -huh. And, you know, the question that we always have to step back and ask is lose at what? Do we want to be competing in a race that would demand that we jettison ethics, that we don't care about the public good, that we throw away our commitments to democratic government, government? Mm. And, you know, my answer is very reflexively no. Um, but I think it's, you know, I, I, I think there are some contests we don't want to win. There are con <laughs> some contests we don't want to enter. And, you know, I think in, in the case of AI, um, there's also the reality that, you know, the reason we see these sort of polls in the US and China is, you know, in the US due to the, you know, historically the kind of, you know, military entanglement with the internet and the development of the surveillance advertising business model out of those companies. Mm. And in China, you know, frankly, because they had a very large self-contained market mm. that was, you know, you know, closely affiliated with the state and sort of nurtured by, you know, state oversight. So that's not, those aren't conditions that we can repeat today. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, this is, Europe is doing, you know, Europe is also trying to sort of, you know, both regulate AI and, you know, figure out how to have a, a European AI market. And yes. you, we've seen these, we've seen this pursuit for, you know, decades at this point. And, you know, it's not, again, these are, it, these corporate forms, the tech companies, you know, the data, the compute, the market reach to continually collect data and the capital, those are, you know, what economists would call sort of self-reinforcing monopolies. Mm. They're not, it's not a, a, a form that you can easily, you know, just simply buy or bootstrap your way into creating. And that's, you know, this is one of, you know, a core tension of the geopolitical debate around technology at this moment. Right. Uh, so I 100% agree with you, but still, I think the race with China narrative is very strong because, yeah. you know, instead of having China AI dominance, it might be better for, you know, Microsoft to have AI dominance because we can still talk to Microsoft compared to China. You think, so what do you think about such an opinion? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I am not, you know, again, I don't do foreign policy. I don't, <laughs> you know, I, I, that is not you know, what I understand is how that story is being used in mm. the kind of debate around technology. I think, you know, again, I would say that, you know, are there other choices be, besides allying with the US or China? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I would, you know, Microsoft also does a lot of business with China, right? <laughs> yes. These aren't sort of you know, the, the, the world of the multinational corporation is much more complex than sim simply an alliance with one Westphalian state or the mm -hmm. other. Um, and I think it's, you know, uh, those those questions are not easily answered. And again, I think they have to be rooted in, you know, the real questions of, you know, life and government, which is, you know, mm -hmm. how do we make sure everyone thrives? How do we make sure, you know, the future is better than the past? How do we address issues like climate, et cetera, et cetera, and does an alliance with Microsoft help us do that? Mm, thank you. So uh, before going to our final questions, could we talk about uh, the Google walkouts and introduce our audience how you have been addressing these problems? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, the Google walkout was one large, uh, it was a, a uh, one day labor action that I helped organize at Google in November of 2018. Mm -hmm. And you know that that started actually much earlier. So mm. it was late 2017 when I learned about a secret contract between Google and the US military, the Department of Defense, um, in which Google was building um, AI technology for drone targeting and surveillance. So, you know, directly contributing to the drone war, which has been 
called illegal by almost every human rights organization. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time I was, I had already founded the AI Now Institute mm -hmm. and I was engaged in examining the social impacts of AI and the problems and issues of you know these technologies. So I didn't feel like I could ethically with any integrity stay at the company doing my job if I didn't speak out against this very clear harmful use of AI. So myself and my some of my colleagues started organizing. We wrote an open letter to Google saying mm -hmm. that Google should not be in the business of war. And this ultimately succeeded in forcing Google to cancel that contract. Right. And it, you know, in the process, it built up um, a practice of labor organizing at Google that spread across tech. And so by the time we got to late, 2018 and the company learned that an executive who had been very famously abusive to the people who worked for him everyone knew that he had been paid 90 million dollars mm -hmm. nine zero <laughs> um there was already a kind of practice of labor organizing that you know, helped helped propel that walkout action. Mm. So across the world, starting in Singapore at 11, 11 a.m., every Google office walked out in its time zone until we got to the West Coast where we had the massive walkout in San Francisco and Mountain View that mm. protested the unethical business decisions that the company had been making and the unwillingness that the company had shown to fix the harmful working conditions that were well known at the company. Hmm. See, so after the walkout, and of course there was a whistleblower from Facebook. Um, do you think companies have changed, or are they acting the same? Well, companies will always act, you know, based on their interests, and the, their interests mm -hmm. are governed by that engine at the center of the shareholder driven corporation which is you know infinite growth infinite profits mm. so i don't think you're ever going to change that <laughs> but what you can do is build you know countermeasures and you can build different forms of power that are more capable of checking that engine of stopping mm. that engine of redirecting that engine and i do think that has happened you know somewhat we've seen you know we've seen much more labor consciousness you know mm. people sort of recognizing these dynamics inside these companies we've seen a move to you know ethics and to you know much more um scientifically grounded conversations about the political economy of the ai industry um so i think you know i certainly think we've seen a lot of really positive change um mm. and i don't think it's done and i don't think it's finished and i you know I think, in a sense, these are practices we just have to agree to maintain, not a job that is done once and then set and then the company's changed, you know, we can go, you know, relax now. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, yeah. Yeah. So do you think uh, companies like Signal can play such a role, you know, like a lot of technology that operates in a different way? Well, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think, you know, mm -hmm. Signal is really showing that there is a model for a different kind of tech mm. organization. Mm. We're a nonprofit, so mm -hmm. we are not governed by that engine. You know, <laughs> our sole focus is on creating a technology that respects people's rights and respects their privacy, which is diametrically opposed to the surveillance business model at the heart of the tech industry. Mm. So we're showing that it can be done differently. We're showing that even in an ecosystem that has been shaped for you know, two, three decades based on assumptions of, you know, surveillance and monetizing surveillance for profit, that we can do something differently and that it can work well for people. Hmm. Um, and I think we are, you know, we're doing that in a way that is sort of raising the bar hmm. for the other companies. So, you know, I absolutely see Signal as sort of part of demonstrating that, you know, 
another world is possible um and that we're doing that by you know proving it every day over and mm -hmm. over again I see. Um, are there similar companies like Signal? Because in Japan, um, you know, there was the lost decades and we're kind of suffering a bad economy and the government is trying to push to innovate and create more startups. So it, it kind of feels that, um, you know, so my question is, if, are there similar companies like Signal in the United States? Are they growing where they're um, in the United States? There are some mm -hmm. tech nonprofits, but there are not, you know, there is no large scale mm. you know, app like signal that is also a nonprofit. So I, you know, signal is, I believe, you know, shaping that form, but happily we're seeing a lot of others who are, you know, beginning to, um, you know, be beginning to adopt that form and beginning to recognize that, you know, people do want an alternative to, you know, surveillance technologies and people are willing to support that. I see. So, so I'm going back to your point you made about uh, chat GPT, um, an AI that people, it's easy for people to use. Do you think that people are more aware of the dangers because we can, you know, touch around, play, play with it and understand what is happening? Do you think, I don't think it's a positive side, but kind of a wake up call for us because now like billions of people are able to use AI and um, understand what's going on. Do you think there is such side to it? Yeah, I, I do think in some cases it's, you know, people are taught to be skeptical when they mm. get a, you know, when chat GPT says two plus two equals six. <laughs> yes. And it, it's clear that is wrong. I think, you know, it's not always so obvious when chat GPT is lying. Mm -hmm. And there was one example that was very disturbing recently where a university, prof somebody somebody entered a prompt involving a university professor into ChatGPT and ChatGPT spit out an incorrect answer that claimed that the university professor had an assault charge against them. Oh. And that, you know, that caused some reputational issues that was fully untrue. But ChatGPT was, you know, again, it's that uncle that just makes things up and <laughs> says it confidently. Uh, and, you know, there's a story in the Washington Post actually on that incident, but it is those more insidious um, examples where ChatGPT is incorrect, where it's fallible, but where we might not know that and we might take it as fact that really, you know, again, there's a real concern about misinformation, about polluting our information ecosystem and about what happens when people treat chat gpt like a search engine i think it was extraordinarily irresponsible to integrate chat gpt into bing when you know a search engine's job is you know to surface relevant material not to guarantee its truth but at least to link out to sources that are deemed to be credible and you know instead they they sort of put this uncle alongside you know the rest of it and that implies that you know the information that ChatGPT is serving up is in fact credible, which I think is uh, is really dangerous. Okay, so I think we need to wrap up. My final question: So, uh, in your opinion, what will be the most um, hopeful, most optimistic future of AI? And what can we do to create such future? Well, I think we can demand that. AI be governed democratically, mm -hmm. that we center the well-being of, you know, people who are most likely to face risks from these systems, um, and that we, you know, we question the marketing narratives and the claims that are being made by the same entities that stand to, you know, profit from mm -hmm. the deployment of these systems. I think those are the ingredients to ensure that AI serves us or that if it doesn't serve us, we don't have to deal with it. We can reject it. OK, thank you so much, Meredith. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I, I appreciate your hosting me. And um, thank you all.